Now, there is a good deal of dysfunction in American politics right now, too, and many ask, what is the future of the Republican Party? With the majority of Republican candidates having either expressed doubt about the legitimacy of the 2020 election or rejected its result outright. These are candidates, of course, in the midterms. Author and journalist Robert Draper examines how this sector of the GOP challenges American democracy itself which he discussed in his new book called Weapons of Mass Delusion, when the Republican Party lost its mind. And he told Michelle Martin what lies ahead. Robert Draper, thank you so much for talking with us. It's really a pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me, Michelle. So your book covers the 18 months that took place since January 6th. And you say it represents the pivot point between this is not normal and this is dangerous and not going away. Would you say more about that? Sure. And directly on the heels of January the 6th, the thinking was the Republican Party is surely going to reckon with itself, realize that, uh, that it had uh, arguably egged on um, this insurrection and would almost certainly descend into a kind of penitent meditation saying, wow, you know, we, we don't want to go this way. Um, instead, uh, the party doubled down and really became uh, an obliging host body for some of the most radical elements in America, uh, uh, spewing disinformation uh, and um, using rhetoric that was increasingly violent. And what made you decide to focus on this? I mean, was the seed of that planted on January 6th when you said to yourself, I have to see what happens next? Or was there something else that made you think, this is what I need to do? This is what I need to focus on? The morning of January the 6th, 2021, was um, the game changer for me. It's when I, I realized, you know, um, the party I'm writing about is altogether different from the party that I'm seeing. And then in the weeks and months to follow, uh, to see the, that uh, um, both in the impeachment hearings and, and after that, that, um, that far from going away, uh, Donald Trump and his hold over the Republican Party became manifest. And uh, that, you know, became especially clear when tracing the trajectory of some of the right wing characters like Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Paul Gosar, uh, Lauren Boebert and others. Um, but um, but in the broadest sense, uh, what was happening was that people who by any ordinary reckoning you would figure would be marginal characters really came to be dominant characters in terms of um, uh, the party's message and the party's behavior. You know, it's hard to pick out one of these figures to kind of focus in on because there's so many stories in your book. Like I'm thinking about Paul Gosar, for example, who had arguably, you know, one of the first public events that became January 6th. I mean, kind of this argument that the election was stolen and that there's got to be some kind of you know, confrontation to address it. And mm. even during the sort of the mob attack on the Capitol was saying, yeah, you know, this is not, you know, these aren't our people, no big deal here, nothing to see. I'm, I'm just so puzzled by that because, I mean, does he think that he was so well known that he would not have been a target? Mobs have no logic. You know, right. mobs I'm are exactly rational actors thinking you, but not you. That's not how it works. But right. Now, I'm glad you brought up Paul Gosar, who I begin the book with. Um, and uh, Gosar uh, became, you know, the first to lead the charge with these so-called Stop the Steal rallies in Arizona, um, was the first joined with Senator Ted Cruz to protest the, um, the certification of the election. And, uh, and so um, this guy who seemed to be a fringe character uh, became rather central. There was another reason also why I focused on Gosar, and that's because, you know, when you ask yourself, so, OK, uh, let's assume, for example, that the Republicans take back the House and uh, and um, and they become, you know, and, and maybe even the Senate and they're running uh, they're running the legislative branch. What will they do with that power? Well, Gosar is a guy who actually, when he looks at himself in the mirror, sees a serious legislator. And, and he actually does want to get certain things done, including critical infrastructure projects in Arizona and all that. The problem with Gosar is that he's viewed as such a reprehensible character by Democrats and, and, and even people in his own party that they won't work with a guy. I mean, mm -hmm. Gosar, for example, you know, as I mentioned in the book, 
um, refuses to call Joe Biden President Biden because he does not recognize his legitimacy. And Democrats have told me, including Democrats who are inclined otherwise to work with a guy like Gosar, that, look, you know, I'm not going to try to have as a co-sponsor for my bill a guy who won't call, um, you know, uh, our leader, President Biden. Uh, I can't expect Democrats to sign on to a bill that has a guy's name on, as a co-sponsor. It can't happen. So um, so this is the conundrum that the Republican, Republican Party faces, you know, going forward, how to be kind of political performance artists uh, for the right on the one hand and to try to govern on the other. A, care, a figure like him presents a problem for, for journalists like us, because in order to report on some of the most outrageous and disgusting things he says, you have to repeat them. Right. And then, then you are continuing to put this stuff in the public domain. No, so, you're right. right? It is a dilemma That's we a all face. Right. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. And, and you know, it's, um, so, you know, and, and Gosar uh, definitely has put us on the horns of that dilemma because he said some incredibly, you know, obnoxious things in the anime that he posted of, of a cartoon character version of himself slaying uh, uh, President Biden and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. He said it was just a joke, but, you know, that stuff goes into the ecosystem and it creates a permission structure for mm-hmm. um, the electorate on the right to believe that it's okay to view this as a kind of, you know, uh, holy war where uh, where the right are a bunch of heroes and the supervillains are people on the left. Uh, so that's, you know, that's part of it. The other part, too, and, and I realize that, that you know, that it's a question I get a lot of, uh, should we even be um, uh, giving any attention at all to people like Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates because that's all they want. They just want attention. And if you uh-huh. don't give them attention, they'll go away. Unfortunately, that's not true. It's a, uh, they've become, uh, they've become people of influence, uh, not because they, they're, they do great committee work or something like that, or even, uh, in Gosar and Greene's case, sit on committees, but because they represent the MAGA base, the Trumpian base, that has now become the um, uh, the uh, central gravitational force within the Republican Party, and and that doesn't change by us refusing to cover them. So let's uh, let's talk about speaking of you know permission structure, and, right. you know, uh, and uh, people of influence. We have to talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Right. You you say that the evolution of her popularity is is basically a case study in GOP politics in the Trump era. So Marjorie Taylor Greene, like Paul Gosar, stripped of committee assignments, basically has a lot of time on her hands and is basically known for being a provocateur. So tell us about her. How did she get started in in politics? Sure, sure. Greene um, was a... uh, co-owner with her husband of the family construction firm in Georgia, uh, uh, owned, co-owned a CrossFit gym, and otherwise viewed herself as a homemaker all the way up until 2019 when she decided to run for office. And she caught a lucky break. The, the district that she uh, was um, running in, the 6th District of Georgia, she was probably going to lose either in the primary or in the general election. But then a new district opened up in a much more conservative area of northwest Georgia. Uh, she she moved over to there and um, immediately styled herself as the Trumpiest of candidates that played very, very well there. Uh, and um, and she showed up to Washington uh, as someone with this QAnon past and with all these other you know offensive social media posts. And, and, the, and the basic view was this is someone who's going nowhere in a hurry. Then, as you referenced, Michelle, uh, just one month into her tenure, as a congresswoman, she was stripped of her committee assignments by the Democrats after more offensive social media posts from her recent past had surfaced. And at that point, it, the, yeah, the view, and certainly for me, covering at this at this juncture um, the Republican Party, I figured, you know, this is worth, you know, maybe a few pages, but but otherwise, Green is a person of no importance. And yet, uh, in that first fiscal quarter, she outraised like every Republican on the Hill. Um, in her first year, she was the fourth highest fundraiser of Republican House members, eclipsed only by two of the leaders, uh, Minority Whip Steve Scalise and Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, as well as Dan Crenshaw. That's a phenomenal achievement uh, for a freshman of any stripe. On top of which, she uh, um, uh, she you know, has this vast social media following. But the most critical thing is that because uh, she's loyal to Trump and Trump loves Green, Kevin McCarthy, who wants to be speaker, 
uh, has kept her close because he believes that he cannot be speaker unless um, he uh, caters to uh, basically Trump and the people who worship Trump. So um, so Green, um, long story short, has become a person of real, not just interest, but influence. And uh, and so for those people who uh, are asking themselves the question, where's the Republican Party going? She is no longer a person who who we all thought would be sitting at the Star Wars bar of political rejects. Um, she's one of the most important people in the Republican Party, like it or not. So talk to me about what is the through line here of the folks that you that you profile? I mean, I think that people sort of see these people as basically hecklers with jobs in right. Congress. Because yeah. they're not really interested in legislating. What is their interest? Like, what's well, the root here? So two parts to that. What are they really trying to do here? Green, for example, has listed a whole constellation of those to me. I mean, she wants to she wants to finish the, the wall uh, uh, that Trump started. She wants a four-year moratorium uh, on immigration of any kind. She mm-hmm. wants to repeal gun safety laws. She wants to repeal uh, any laws that uh, attempt to um, address climate change. Uh, she, uh, she, I mean, there's, you know, she wants a nationwide ban on abortion. Uh, so, you know, there, there are plenty of things she stands for. It's a, it's a def- different question whether they can accomplish mm-hmm. those, whether they're capable of governing. Now, what's the through line of all of them? The through line, I would put succinctly, is that they are the title of the book. They are the weapons of mass delusion. And, um, and what I mean by that is that they have um, promulgated Uh, disinformation that is now swallowed whole by tens of millions of Americans who happen to be uh, Republicans. And obviously chief among those is that the 2020 election was stolen, but it doesn't end there. It's, um, it's also that, uh, you know, the whole Russia thing was a hoax, that January the 6th was variously a nothing burger or a setup Mm -hmm. or something instigated by Antifa. Uh, It was that the the um, COVID vaccines at minimum are ineffectual and at maximum are killers, uh, that uh, the mainstream media habitually lies and is in collusion with, you know, the deep state. And uh, it is that uh, the Democrats are not just liberals, not even just socialists, but that they're communists. These are these are, you know, seemingly, um, you know, social social media uh, memes promulgated ceaselessly by uh, Gosar, Green, uh, Madison, Cawthorn, Lauren, Boebert, uh, Matt Gates, and others, that nonetheless have become gospel um, for tens of millions of people. So and then I- the question becomes, what about all the other people who are not so taken with these bizarre conspiracies, many of which are rooted in anti-Semitism and racism and, you know, all the other things. So mm-hmm. So what about them? Where are they in this? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's my book basically deals with three different types of Republicans. The first are the weapons of mass delusion type of Republicans that you and I have just been talking about. The second are the the, the very notably small handful of Republicans who have stood up uh, to those spreaders of mass delusion, uh, most notably uh, Liz Cheney, and it played often a political price for doing so. The much larger swath of Republicans, the third category, are those who you're referencing, Michelle, who um, who don't subscribe you know, to these crazy views, um, but recognize that a lot of their voters do, and they're scared of them. Uh, they And the rationale that they have said over and over, not just to me, but to some Democrat, uh, Democratic office holders who they're friends with, that, uh, look, you know, uh, I know you want me to denounce, you know, Matt Gates and Marjorie mm-hmm. Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar. If I do that, I'm going to get primaried. And if I get primaried, I'm probably going to lose. And if I lose the person who comes to Capitol Hill, mm-hmm. you're not going to like that person. That person's going to be, you know, um, you know, Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene on steroids. And uh, and so you'll thank me later that I'm going to ground now and being quiet about all of this. The problem with this scenario, uh, which I think is an understandable scenario, a conundrum that a lot of Republicans face is that, but then how, how does all this end? You know, mm-hmm. uh, 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 you know what's, um, how, how do they foresee a scenario in which tens of millions of Americans who have swallowed whole the lie that the 2020 election was stolen um, wake up one day and decide, nah, that's not true or that's not important to me? What happened if the Democrats... Why are they so ineffectual in dealing with with this phenomenon? 
Sure. Well, I mean, part of it is, as you well know, Michelle, that, that um, we're in a moment in time, uh, we're in a particular election cycle that historically favors the party out of power, right? I mean, so um, the midterms of 2022 tend to be a referendum on the sitting president, and they tend to result in a kind of check on that president by the opposition party picking up seats. And so that's part of the headwinds historically that the Democrats face. But the other part is that um, the Democrats, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to push certain issues that are not top of mind to voters. And, and I'm not casting judgment on, on them for doing so. I'm just stating it as a fact. We've seen in public opinion polls that uh, that uppermost in the electorate's mind is not um, uh, the stakes vis-a-vis -vis American democracy, but instead uh, inflation in the economy. And um, uh, democracy and voting rights are well down the list. And and uh, you can't blame the Democrats for talking about that stuff. Um, but it's also not utterly surprising that uh, the electorate is responding more in terms of pocketbook issues. Obviously, the Republican voters um, and maybe some independents we, we shall see on November the 8th are of the view that, OK, you know, Herschel Walker, very imperfect candidate, uh, you know, may well have, uh, you know, paid for an abortion, but he will be perhaps a deciding vote on matters near and dear to us. We have seen this kind of Faustian bargain, of course, take place with uh, the evangelicals and Donald Trump, who, you know, on his face, um, not exactly the most appealing candidate, it would seem to evangelicals. Now they've utterly embraced him because he gave them what they wanted. And if Herschel Walker manages to cast deciding votes, uh, then they really have just chosen not to care about his past. And and what about the former president who our once and possibly future president, Donald Trump? Um, what role does he play in this? Does, does this movement even need him anymore? No, no, he's certainly the galvanizing force and the catalyst, Michelle. But I, but I think you've, in a way, answered your own question. No, I don't think the movement requires him anymore because he has shown the Republican Party a new way. Uh, you know, you'll well recall that after Romney lost to Obama in 2012, the the Republican Party, led by its National Committee and its and its Chairman Reince Priebus, uh, wrote this Growth and Opportunity Project that was basically about expanding the to attract more voters. Well, Trump essentially said to the Republican Party, you don't need to do that. It's too hard to persuade people who don't like you to like you. It's much easier to persuade people who like you to love you and then to demonize the other side in an effort to, to get the people who love you to turn out maybe suppress um, the other side to suppress their vote. And most of all, if all that fails, if that doesn't work out and you lose, claim you won and they stole it from you. You know, that's that's the formula that Trump has now laid out. We already see, you know, that being, you know, we, we've we heard, uh, you know, Kerry Lake, the, the gubernatorial candidate for Arizona, um, uh, refuse to say that she will concede the race uh, if, if she loses. Many other Republicans are saying that as well. Uh, they're taking their cues from Trump, but they don't need Trump anymore. He has he has created a new and dangerous path that many Republicans are following. Robert Draper, thank you so much for talking with us. It's really a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Michelle.